Okay, good morning. That is my alarm indicating that it's 10 50 and time for us to begin. I do uh, set an alarm that marks the beginning and the end of the class session so that you don't have a clock in there so that you don't have to uh, worry about I'm going to you know, start late or go over or something like that. Occasionally, that alarm will go off at um, 12.05, this class, in, class session ends at 12.05, and I may be in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a thought or something like that, and so it does, it's not like in high school when that bell rings, right, like everybody takes off, right, it just means that it's time for me to shut it down, and I try to do that as quickly as possible, and that alarm goes off if, if that's where we're at in the class session. Anyway, it also means that um, you won't need to worry about having a phone to keep track of the time or something like that. One of the things that you're going to discover, if you haven't already, uh, anybody in here read the syllabus yet? Okay. Okay. Uh, the rest of you will, uh, one of your first orders of business uh, here over the next uh, few hours. Um, I do uh, ask that if you bring a cell phone with you to class that you power it off. Okay. Uh, you don't need it in this class for any of the learning activities that we undertake, so better not to have it as a distraction. Just power it off and put it away, and um, that way uh, it doesn't uh, distract the persons around you, even though we're spread out here. It doesn't distract me. That's not a good, good thing ever so, to do that. Uh, most importantly, though, it doesn't distract you. Okay. Um, anyway, we can talk about uh, classroom policies and all that kind of stuff here in just a few minutes. I want to uh, start today's class session making sure that everybody's in the right place, okay? And I do, uh, as a general rule, uh, in face-to-face -face class sessions, I close the door once the class session starts. I'm not going to do that today, but we probably have, maybe for the first couple of class meetings, because we have uh, probably a few people that may be uh, trying to make their way over to the classroom. Um, at any rate, um, for those of you who um, just sign up for classes and don't really check to see who the professor is that's listed on the schedule, my name is William Fagan, and uh, this is my, um, I guess I'll be finishing up my seventh year here at WCJC at the end of the spring semester, but before that I was for many years uh, at, uh, for the longest period of time in a place called Temple College, which is in Central Texas, but I've been at various other places going back a long, long time. In fact, the first time I stepped into the college classroom as a faculty member was fall semester 1984, if you can believe that. Uh, I don't <coughs> draw any conclusions about how old I am based on that, because you have to understand, I was the Doogie Hauser of political science. Does that reference mean anything to anybody? <laughs> OK. Um, well, welcome back to campus. If you um, if you were uh, a WCJ student here at the Sugarland campus last spring when things shut down, uh, it's nice to be back on campus. Certainly, from my perspective, I hope that you feel the same way. Online learning is good for some things, but you know, some people it's just not for everybody, right? And I assume that's why you guys are in the face-to-face -face class. Um, so, uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to um, Oh, I forgot to do this. Let me do this real quick. I'm going to call the names that I have on the roster for this class, and you need to indicate to me that you're here, and that we, you know, most importantly, we need to make sure that you're, if you're sitting in this classroom, you're actually enrolled in this class. So as soon as this thing comes up, I'll do that. Anybody have any questions while that's warming up? Okay. Well, uh, how many of you have made? Uh, gotten to the point of purchasing a textbook for the class, or obtaining a textbook for the class, just one person. Okay, so the rest of you will need to do that uh, in short order, because as you'll see, we get underway, right out of the gate, we get underway, not only with lecture material, but also with reading material. Okay, looks like that's up and ready to go, so as you can see, I have on the screen um, a spreadsheet that I use for keeping attendance. The college requires that faculty members keep an accurate attendance record. So uh, this is government 2305. This number right here, the CRN, is um, 
uh, you know, I don't think you need to memorize it for any reason, but, uh, you know, that's the official course number that the college uses. Uh, it, this class meets from um, today through, um, well, it says here May the 14th, but we actually don't meet that long. I think our final in this class is on like May the 11th or something like that, okay? Uh, and of course, we meet from 1050 to 1205. Is that consistent with what you all thought when you were signing up? Okay, good. All right. So again, I have the names here. I'm going to call these out. If you have something that you would prefer to be called, just let me know here, and I'll put that in here, and I'll be happy to call you that. I think, you know, that's one basic consideration I can give to anyone that you all uh, is to call you what you want to be called, and I, I will do that as long as it's not a title that you haven't earned. <laughs> All right. Natalie Arana? Yeah. Right? And by the way, if I mispronounce your name, uh, please correct me, and I'll try to get it right in the future. Ready? Victoria Chapman. Oops. Where's Victoria? Okay. Jacob Escobedo. Johan Fitch. Angie Garcia. Okay. Maria Garcia. Yeah. Okay. Adam Guerra. Did I say it right? Everett Hutchins. April Jackson, Sham Khan, Amareze Matamira. I'm sorry. It's called Amari. Amari. Yeah. Like A A. Spell it for me. How, how do you what white person do you spell? A N A R A. Okay. <laughs> and Matamira. Is that how you say your last name? Okay. Alexandra Scobie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Christian Shaw? Yeah. Okay. Corey Spencer? Yeah. Okay. And Joanna Vinicotter? Yeah. Okay. Is there anyone whose name I didn't call? Okay. We have a couple of people out here in the first class meeting, but that's not shocking. That's fairly routine, in fact, uh, I think for any given semester, but I would think particularly given the current pandemic situation that we're in. Okay, um, so what we're going to do with today's class session uh, is we're going to talk a little bit about the course, what's specifically we're going to look at the course syllabus, talk about course requirements, course policies, and all that sort of stuff. And I think we'll also have a chance to move on and begin a discussion of some, some material, okay? But the most important thing for today's class session, well, the initial thing for today's class session is just to make sure that you're all clear about how the course is set up um, and what you're going to be required to do in order to get your three hours of credit for this. By the way, does anybody know why you get three hours of credit for most of your college courses? I know there are some exceptions to that, but there are some two-hour courses and there are some four-hour courses and so on. But you know, like uh, most of the college credit courses are generally three hours. No, anybody know where that comes from? Well, in, in a 16-week semester a long semester, traditional fall or spring semester, um, you're supposed to be in class for three hours a week. Okay? So um, if it's a Tuesday, Thursday class such as this one, 12, uh, or excuse me, 10.50 to 12.05, we call that an hour and a half. It's not literally an hour and a half, but there's some time there to, you know, move to your next class and so on, or come from your previous class. So uh, that's an hour and a half there, and then on Thursday, an hour and a half, right? So that's three hours. That's where that comes from. So when you take, uh, if you take, for example, an online class, and you're going to get three hours of credit for that, it should be the approximate equivalent of that three hours of class. And that's kind of can kind of be a, a challenge, I think, for both the faculty member and the uh, and the student a lot of times. And it may be why many of you have decided you really need to be back in a face-to-face -face class, despite the pandemic. <laughs> Not, I doubt that very many people thought, well, three hours a week, you know, in a class for a class online, that's, you know, I doubt that many of you thought about it that way, but, you know, there may be some connection there. Okay? All right, so we're going to uh, talk about the course here. Uh, we're going to look at the course syllabus. I got a, um, 
ask you this. How many of you um, know how to log into Blackboard? Is there anybody who doesn't know how to get to Blackboard or log into Blackboard? Because we do use Blackboard. Even though this is a face-to-face -face class, it's what we call a web-enhanced class. And that means that you're going to have to be going to Blackboard. Uh, not as much as you would if you were an online class, but you're going to have to be at least, you know, from time to time, okay? So is there anyone who doesn't know how to get to Blackboard? Okay, well, I'm going to forego that part of it then and just go straight to what happened to all my icons. There we go. Okay, so when you log into Blackboard, you will see on the Blackboard homepage a list of, of uh, your courses, okay, under the heading My Courses. And depending on the browser that you're using and maybe the device that you're using, the setup may look, uh, look, look different. I think it looks different on a phone, for example, or uh, maybe an iPad or something like that. But if you're on a desktop computer or a laptop computer, which I encourage students um, when they're doing their coursework to do it on either a desktop computer or a laptop computer. I know that you love your phones, and but I, you know I just don't think that the interface is quite there yet to um, minimize problems that you might encounter. And then of course you also have problems with connectivity and so on. At any rate, um, under this, um, in this panel here that says my courses, you'll see all the courses that you're enrolled in this semester, um, whether they're face-to-face -face classes or online classes. And, you know, obviously you just need to find to get to the course material for, for this class. You just need to um, go to uh, the link that says uh, federal government. I have several ones that say federal government here, but you're just going to have one, okay? So, it's this one here. You see the nice picture that I took about a year ago when I was in Washington, D.C., before there was rioting and all that sort of stuff uh, of the Lincoln uh, Memorial. Um, at any rate, um, under this picture of Honest Abe, you have a link to something called My Announcements. And you should check these on a fairly regular basis because um, you never know if there might be new information out there that you need to know. Uh, I, I do make announcements in face-to-face -face classes. I do make them in class. But you know, we only meet twice a week, all right? So there may be some reason I would have to get an announcement out there that you need to see before our next class meeting, OK? Uh, so you need to check that. And there are already some announcements out there, as you can see. Um, and you should read over those very carefully. I'm not going to read over those with you in class today. You can do that on your own, all right? Okay, uh, beyond that, uh, you don't have a whole lot of links. I call this the navigation pane over here on the left hand side of the screen. I'm not sure what the distance education people call it. When you take it, you've got to, do you all have to take a Blackboard training course? You don't have to take a Blackboard, any kind of, no, you're just enrolling classes in there? Okay. Uh, maybe you can take online courses. They make it, have any of you taken online courses? Does that make you do that in an online course? No? Okay. Well, anyway, I don't know what they call them. I don't think they call it a navigation pane, but I go way back, you know, to the beginnings of the internet when people began setting up things like this. I, you know, they just used to, they used to call it a navigation thing. So there aren't very many links here uh, for you guys in an online class. This is there's a lot of stuff here, but uh, initially here we're just going to click on course documents, and you can see I already have several things out here for you that you need to read over and make sure that you're familiar with all the information in there. Don't put that off. You know, just like as soon as you possibly can between now and our next class meeting, make sure you read over this, all this stuff. When you come in on Thursday, we can take a couple of minutes at the top of the class meeting. I can field whatever class, uh, questions that you might have about this information. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, I'm worried about having the mask on. I talk pretty loud under normal circumstances, but I was wondering if I should get like a little mic or something. But no, you guys can hear me? Okay, good. Um, so, this copyright notice appears on all the courses here at, at the college. This is the main link for us uh, this semester. This is the course syllabus. I'm going to open this up here and look at this with you here in just a second. But notice there are a couple of other things here. This document is information that appears at the end of the course syllabus, but the due dates, the schedule of due dates, learning uh, availability of learning materials, and so on. I I just uh, cut that off at the end of the at the end of the syllabus and created a separate document that is so you can go in quicker and find you don't have to scroll through the entire syllabus. Okay, 
Um, here's a document called Instructions for Weekly Posts. I'll be talking about those here in just a second when we talk about course requirements. Here is uh, something you need to take care of pretty early on here over the next couple of days. I'd like you to do it, if you will, before you come to class next Thursday. Um, who's taking a face-to-face -face class at the, at the college before this semester? So going back to spring of 2021 or fall of 2020, spring of 2020, fall of 2019, et cetera, right? You know how they, the, your professor comes in and passes around this document that you're supposed to sign off on? Um, we're going to really minimize the paper that we pass around. Now, that's always been, the tr been true in uh, the, the courses that I teach. Like, I haven't passed out a paper syllabus to a class probably in about 12, 13, 14 years or something like that, okay? But um, the college is really pretty uh, serious about minimizing the threat of the coronavirus. We don't want to have to shut down again, right? So I'm not going to pass out anything, and that includes that, that document that you sign off on, right? So instead, what you're going to do is come out here. We're going to do it like we do it in the online classes. Uh, you're going to come out here and just click on that link that says receipt of course syllabus. It's set up like a quiz. Don't worry. It doesn't count towards the calculation of your course grade. There's one question on the quiz, and I even give you the correct answer to that question. The incorrect answer is something like, I have received a copy of the course syllabus, and I've read it, and I understand, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you all are familiar with that drill, maybe in online classes that you've taken or, or remember the old the way we used to do it face to face. So please do that. Make a note to yourself. Don't forget to, to do that over the next 24, 48 hours. Okay? Academic honesty, integrity in online and face to face classes. Please read that very carefully. And finally, here is a link to a video recording. It's a YouTube video that I recorded. Oh, four years ago, I guess. Yeah, um, spring semester. No, must have been fall semester 2015, and I added it in 2016. It doesn't really matter. I was sitting in a classroom. I was, you know, having a class session with a group of students. It was uh, in a classroom upstairs on this campus that we used to use as an inter interactive TV course, where we would. Um, we had a setup where we could send a video feed to the Wharton campus or the Richmond campus or maybe even some of the high school, uh, you know, high schools that we do dual credit with. So I would have, I had a, a, a group of students sitting sitting in front of me in the classroom upstairs, but then I also had a group at Wharton and I had a group at Richmond and I had a couple of high schools in there, all in one class, okay, and. It was fairly late in the semester, but I was probably, you know, almost to the end of the semester, and I was talking about, well, I don't remember what the topic was, but um, it occurred to me as, you know, I looked around the room of the people in front of me, and I looked at the screen and the students that were in those other campuses, and I was amazed by how many people were just kind of sitting there and not taking notes. <laughs> it, I, you know, I, I guess that probably wasn't the first time that I had noticed that, but at, you know, uh, in previous semesters or whatever. But for whatever reason, it really impressed me um, because there was no one. There was no one who was you know taking notes. And I really believe that in order to be successful in this course, and I think probably a lot of college courses, that's a skill that you really need to hone. Okay, that's something that you really need. It's not something that comes naturally for a lot of people taking good notes. But I think if you can learn to take good notes, it, there's a lot of payoff to it. It's like any other skill, though. It's like shooting free throws or any of your musicians. Okay? You know anybody here a musician? Okay? Anybody take music lessons when you were a kid, piano lessons or violin lessons? Nobody. Wow. Well, trust me, playing the scales is drudgery, right? But there's a lot of payoff to it if you, you can learn to do that, whether it's the piano or whether it's guitar or violin or whatever the instrument is. Um, and I can't, any of you golfers? No? What do you do? What do you all do? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever your interest is, like your avocation is, your hobbies or whatever, to get good at them, you have to practice, right? And it's really no different in this course, in most college courses, there are certain skills that you have to hone in order to get good at them. 
but they have that there's a lot of payoff. So what I did in this video here, it's about 11 minutes, a little over 11 minutes. I was just talking to this group about how to, you know, take good notes. And I don't think that I'm an expert on note taking by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a political scientist, an economist by education and training. I'm not a teacher by training. I don't have a, any background really at all in theories of learning or in, you know, uh, that, you know, that sort of thing, the college, the college of education sort of uh, things. Um, but I do have a lot of experience, okay? And that uh, is something over the years that I've really become increasingly convinced of that good notes, good note taking skills go a long way in, in you know, helping you um, learn the curriculum of the course. Okay. Okay. So you can look at that. I'm not going to check to see if you did or didn't. Um, but if you think there might be something in there that you can use, some information that you can use, why not invest 11 minutes? Have a look at it. Okay. All right. Let's go up here and look at the course syllabus because, as I said, that's the main, the main uh, thing that we want to look at today. This uh, first page probably looks really familiar to you because it's a template. The information is different, but the template, it looks the same in all college, all the college's classes. So um, again, this is government, oops, that says 2306, but it should say 2305. I need to go in and change that, don't I? I sure do. Is that, is that a six or is that a five? I can't, my vision is not there. It looks like a six, doesn't it? Yeah, it should say 2305, I'll change that, okay? Uh, Again, uh, here's a brief, here's the meeting times. Here's a brief description of the course. This is what you see in the college catalog. Um, there is an attendance policy that we'll look at here in just a second. Last day to drop the course with a grade of W is way down the road, Friday, April the 16th. Okay. Uh, let's just, I'm not going to read through this verbatim. I'm just going to highlight a few things, go through each of these headings and most of these headings and just highlight a couple of things. Okay, on this communication policy, basically what it says is there are several ways for you to communicate with me. Face to face, okay, before this class, after this class, during posted office hours that you see here, okay, uh, you see that, um, you know, I have some hours here that I keep here on the, on the Sugarland campus. My actual office is over on the Richmond campus, so you're welcome to come over there at those posted office hours as well, okay. Um, so I'm happy to meet with you in person. The pandemic conditions, you know, again, they make things a little bit more difficult. So it may be that you will want to do one of these alternative sort of things uh, if you have questions or if you have concerns about the course. So um, you can obviously give me a call. My office phone number is listed up here. Um, I have voicemail on that. You can leave me a message. But because I'm between the Richmond campus and the Sugar Land campus, a lot of times I don't see that blinking light on my phone until hours, maybe even a day later. Right? So um, another way to um, communicate with me is I'm going to be holding virtual office hours. Okay? During, during these times, you can see listed here, notice it says here Blackboard Collaborate. Okay? Richmond, there's my office in Richmond, 240K, but it says here, collaborate. And that's just some virtual office hours. I'll show you that here in just a couple of minutes. You can pop in, ask me your questions or, or share your concerns with me, whatever we can have. You know, it's, it's like a Zoom meeting, right? All right, uh, and then of course you can do it by email, but um, the college is really encouraging uh, students for years and years, that was here before the pandemic, the, the line was that we were supposed to emphasize to students was use your WCJC email, okay? And now it's, well, it's better to use the course messaging system, uh, system in Blackboard, okay? So you can do that by clicking on course messages, okay? And send me uh, a message that way, okay? Of course, that's not live. That's not a, a synchronous, as they say in the parlance of the internet, right? It's not a synchronous conversation. It's an asynchronous conversation. I think that 
Synchronous conversations are better. I think you're less likely to, there's less likely to be confusion, right? Um, because anything that's unclear can be cleared up on the spot. So I would encourage you to use that Blackboard Collaborate if we can't actually have a face-to-face -face meeting, okay? All right, um, I'm gonna let you read over these um, core objectives yourself. Um, this is coming from the state of Texas. The Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board says that students who complete government 2305, 2306 should obtain mastery um, or at least competence in uh, four areas, critical thinking, communication, personal responsibility, and social responsibility. And furthermore, mandated that people like me, faculty and the government, teaching the government courses, have to have some mechanism for assessing your competencies in those areas. Now what we're doing this semester, as you'll see, is we're doubling up. We have two core competency assessments in here. One that assesses critical thinking and communication and the other that assesses social responsibility and personal responsibility. So more on that here in just a bit. Here are the objectives specific to the curriculum of this course, constitutional democracy in the United States, understanding of a federal system, uh, separation of powers, checks and balances, etc. Okay. And as you'll see, when we get down to the topical syllabus, the specific topics on the syllabus are consistent with those objectives, okay, those outcomes. And you should know that the final exam here in this course is comprehensive. It tests over the breadth of the course and it's organized around these SLOs. Okay. All right. Only one person said that he had the textbook, but for the rest of you, here's the information that you need. It's sold in the bookstore on the Richmond campus or the Wharton campus, and I think they will send it to you. I think they'll ship it to you if you want to. I think you can call them or maybe you can maybe have a way to order it online or something like that. Don't wait. Don't wait much longer, okay? I don't know what their supply looks like, okay? And that's all I'm really, can, I mean, I, that's all I can really say about where you can get it, okay? I want you to be aware, though, because it has happened every semester I've been here, basically, going back to 2013, I'll have at least one student a semester that decides to buy the textbook some other way and they end up getting the wrong textbook. It's really easy to get the wrong textbook. You're gonna get it if you got, you're gonna get the correct textbook if you go to the bookstore, okay? But it's really easy to get the wrong textbook doing it some other way. And, I, and just one reason for that, one big reason for that is this textbook, the title that you see there, We the People 12th Edition by Ginsburg, Lowy, et cetera, there are several versions of that textbook. This is the full version of the textbook. There's an essentials version. There's a brief version. There's a couple of different, ver several different versions, and they don't match up. And since we are going to be quizzing you on the information in this version of the textbook, I really want to encourage you to obtain that version of the textbook. Textbooks are not cheap, I know. That's why I say obtain. And I don't say buy, because there may be any number of ways that you can obtain a textbook. Uh, you know, most people buy it, but if you want to go in partners, halvesies with someone, or, you know, um, however you want to do it, um, you know, that's up to you. But make sure you get the right textbook. It's the hardcover version. And I, I in the old days, um, I used to bring in a copy of the textbook with me in the face-to-face -face classes and show it, but because my office is over there, <laughs> It's just one other thing that I have to cart around with me, so I stopped doing that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so is the digital copy not okay? Is what? Is the digital copy not okay? The ebook, as long as it is not the Essentials Edition, as long as the full version of the textbook is exactly the same. It is, I've looked at that, they are exactly the same. But again, you've got to be sure that you're getting the full edition. So it's okay, like, if I bring my laptop in? Well, we don't use the textbook in class, so you don't need to bring it with you. In fact, those of you who are going to buy the textbook 
hardcover textbook, you don't need to bring that with you to class. I can't think of any circumstances under which I, I don't really lecture out of the textbook. Okay? But we do use the textbook. It's just outside of the classroom. Somebody, yes? Um, would you be able to like copy and paste that into Google so we can see which one? Like to make sure you get the right text? Can I cop? Yeah. Like the search Oh, you just want to see what it looks like? Well, let's see here. I don't know um, what will happen. Let me try. This is it right here. 12th edition. See, look, this is the essentials. It doesn't, it doesn't even have the same, like it has fewer chapters, and the chapter numbers don't match up necessarily, right? And the information in the chapters is more minimal here. So I feel bad for people that get the essentials version of the textbook, and then they don't perform as well on the, on the quizzes because all the information is not there. Yep, this is the one you need right here. Does that help? You're welcome. Okay, and you'll also need access to a computer and to Blackboard's online, uh, the college's online learning platform. Um, again, to get the documents that I put out for you, like this course syllabus and those other things that I, you know, breezed past, and anything else that I might put out there the rest of the semester, you'll need that. Um, but uh, also because there are. Um, the core competency assessments that you'll be completing online. So you're turning in those, turning those in on Blackboard, okay? And if for some reason, hopefully not, but if the administration should decide that we have to go back to online, uh, full online format, then you'll be, uh, you'll be, you know, right in, right in spring. Okay, uh, in fact, here I, I have a little blurb here in the syllabus here to that effect. Okay, so you can read over that as well. All right, let's talk about course requirements. We've been talking about course requirements. What do you got to do to get through the course? Okay, um, the way I approach this course is that there are two sources of the curriculum for the course. The curriculum means the information that we learn in the course, right? So there are two sources of that curriculum. One source of the curriculum is the textbook that I just showed you the picture of the cover there. Okay? The authors of that textbook are highly respected political scientists, Ginsburg and Ted Lowy and the others that are um, co-authors on that textbook. Most of them have been around a long time and have a lot of expertise. They bring a lot to the table, so to speak. Um, so one of the things that we do is quiz you over the information that they bring to the table. That's in the weekly reading quizzes. Okay? The other source of the curriculum, if I can be so bold, to suggest that to you is that it's me. I'm the other source of the curriculum. I have the background, the education of political science, just like Lowy and Ginsburg and so on. I'm not so high powered at Stanford or, you know, um, Wherever, wherever these guys are now, I'm not even really sure where they're at. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I've been around for a while. I've you know done the hard work of you know that's required to um, be qualified to uh, to say that. So um, I hope that doesn't seem too uh, pompous or anything. But I, I, I'd like to think I bring something to the table too. Okay, and we do that in the Tuesday Thursday class sessions. Come in and I. As I hinted a few minutes ago, I, I really don't lecture from the textbook, okay? There are some things that the authors of your textbook do really well, and I don't really feel like I can add to that, okay? There are some things that the authors of your textbook don't do very well or at all, and those may be things that I decide to emphasize. You will notice that there's some overlap <clears throat> between the way that the authors of your textbook cover a topic and the way that I cover a topic, but it's certainly not identical. In fact, sometimes there will be occasions you might notice where they seem to be, even something as simple as a definition may seem to be inconsistent. Their definition of something, my definition of something, you know, 
it's not that one's right and the other's wrong. Hold on. It's not, it's, it really has more to do with theoretical perspective. They, they come to it with one theoretical perspective. I come to it with a different theoretical perspective. Okay? Um, so you're going to notice that, I think, as we go along. But the most, you know, sort of the most general thing I want to say here is that because I'm not lecturing to you from the textbook, there are these two different sources of the course curriculum, and we find a way to quiz you over both. Okay? So the way that we do that is through lecture quizzes, weekly lecture quizzes, and weekly reading quizzes. We're not going to do unit tests in this class this semester. I've done unit tests forever, and I've decided maybe a better way to do that is just on a week-to-week -week basis. Rather than four weeks of material test, another four weeks of material test, another, you know, however, however we might do that. Uh, like, I think a lot of classes are set up that way. We're experimenting a little bit here. Let's see if we can, you know, for some, a lot of students, the curriculum of this course is challenging. So let's see if doing it this way on a week-to-week -week basis makes it a little bit easier to, for you to get something out of the curriculum and, you know, kind of, as long as you stay up, you know, to speed. If you fall behind, then it's a, little, it's a different story. Okay? So every Tuesday when we come in here, Probably right out of the gate. Probably the first thing that we do is we'll take a lecture quiz. We don't have one this week. Okay? We're going to cover some material today and then on Thursday. But next Tuesday when you come in, a lecture quiz. Okay? And that will be 10 multiple choice questions. Every week we're going to do it. Every week on Tuesday. We'll have from week 2 to week 15. Okay? Um, So uh, multiple choice format questions based on the information that we covered in the previous week's class session. All right. Uh, each one of those is going to be worth 2% of the course grade. Okay. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but you don't want to blow those off because if you start blowing those things off, like if you're not studying your notes and you're not preparing for those to come in on Tuesday and take a, a quiz, and you start you know, making 40s and 50s and 30s and stuff all those things, it will show up in your course grade at the end of the semester. So think about them as a block of material. Right? So even though each one's only worth 2% of your course grade, altogether they're worth 20% of your course grade. Right? So it's, you can probably appreciate a little bit better why that would have, how that could have a pretty significant, significant impact on your course grade. Right? All right, so that's a total of 14 lecture quizzes. Now I'm going to drop out. You know, you, you already got, oh, that arithmetic doesn't work, Megan. I, I, I could figure that out. No, it doesn't because 2 times 14 isn't 20%. 2% times 14 is not 20%, right? So we drop out the lowest four quiz scores. And that includes zeros for any quizzes that you might have missed because you weren't in class during the Tuesday session to take it. Or maybe you take all 14 and you have 80s and 90s on most of them, but you have one that's a 60 and you have one that's a 50. Hey, you know, those can just drop out and not have any impact on your course grade. You drop four of those. Right? Does that make, make sense? And then the same thing with reading quizzes, except the reading quizzes are true false format. But again, 14 of them beginning next week, Thursday, we come in, we take the reading quiz, right? 10 true false statements based on the reading material from the previous week. Okay. Again, the highest 10 scores count with the calculation of your course grade. So that's 20% and 20%. That's 40% of your course grade right there. Okay, any questions about that? Give you a second to think about it. Any questions? There are no makeups, okay, on any of the work in this course. Okay. And in this particular, in these two particular instances, the reason is that I'm dropping four. <laughs> That's a very generous, by the way, uh, I think a very generous drop, uh, a number of drops. But I'm not done. <laughs> like one of those, like one of those pitch men on TV, right? That's not the end of it. Okay. So each week, again. 2 through 14, or uh, weeks 2 through 15, that's 14 weekly discussion posts. 
And those are down on Blackboard. You can read over this yourself. There's another document out there. Remember, I just, I just scrolled past it very quickly a few minutes ago. There's a document under course documents that says weekly discussion posts. You need to read over that. We don't have one this week, but beginning next week, week two, on Friday, sorry, the discussion board opens on Friday. So we have our class sessions next week, Tuesday and Thursday class sessions. We'll cover material in those class sessions. And then on Friday, the discussion board opens. Okay? And again, I'm not going to go through all that. Unless you have questions, I'll be happy to address whatever questions. But you can read through those, uh, you know, that detail that I provided for you, not only here on the syllabus, but on that other document. Okay? So what you're required to do, your discussion board for each week will require you to be a primary, to do a primary post and a secondary post. And that's pretty typical of the way I think discussion boards work in college classes, right? Have you encountered that before? Right? You've got to do a discussion board and then you got to read somebody else's post and then respond to their discussion, their, their post. Yeah. Okay. So we do that and um, Again, that's 14 weeks of 14 discussion posts. We dropped the lowest score. Okay. So there's 60% of your course grade. Course grade. 20% for the lecture quizzes, 20% for the reading quizzes, and now another 20% for the discussion boards. Okay. Question? All right, here's the next piece the core competency assessments. As I said, there are four core competencies for this course. Anybody remember what they are? Without looking for screen? <laughs> Critical thinking, communication, social responsibility, and personal responsibility. This is something we have to do, folks. It's not something that I, I'm doing on my own volition. I probably would not have said, I kind of think that, you know, I told you at the start that you know, the first time I walked into a college classroom was fall semester 1984 as faculty member. Um, I kind of think that since the fall semester, 1984, I've been assessing students' critical thinking and to some extent their communication, but not formally. Right? Um, I would not choose to assess social responsibility and personal responsibility if it was up to me. But the state of Texas says we have to do it. And so we've come up with two assessment instruments, and I will provide details. In this area of the course website, I'm hoping I can get that up there by the end of the day tomorrow, okay? And you can begin work on those right out of the gate if you want. This is something you do outside class. <clears throat> All right? So those are worth 5% of your course grade. Each one of those are 5%. That's another 10%. So again, here we go. 20% reading quizzes, 20% lecture quizzes, 20% weekly discussion board posts, another 10% are core competency assessments, we're up to 70%, and the last 30% of your course grade is the final exam. That's a big deal. The departmental exam, again, I don't have any choice in it. I, I, I have to administer a comprehensive final exam. As I said, it's a departmental exam. I have some minimal discretion over various features, but for the most part, it is, um, you know, a departmental exam, and it's multiple choice format. And uh, what else can I say about that? I already have a link over here on the course website that says final exam information. So from the day, first day of the semester, you have access to this document where you can go out. And I would, I would encourage you to use this as you go along through the semester. You know, if nothing else, kind of as a checklist, you know, or, or reference, you know, like uh, you, you can expect to see questions on the final exam that test you over these aspects of constitutional democracy. So you can kind of use it as, oh, I need to make sure that I, for the final exam, that I know what the three-fifths compromise is, right? Or I need to make sure that I know for the final exam uh, what uh, the issues were in McCulloch versus Maryland, right? I provide this document because um, this is a pretty ambitious course. Both of the government courses, both 2305 and 2306, I think 
are pretty ambitious in that there's a lot of material that we cover in these courses and uh, I think it's a challenge in preparing for a final exam to go back to the beginning of the semester and study all that detail, you know, like in, in depth, study that detail. Hopefully in taking quizzes every week, it will make that a little bit easier because you're preparing every week for a quiz. But, you know, in conjunction with this document, this guidance document file exam, you can kind of highlight the things that you need to look at and, and review for the final exam. Okay, any questions about those course requirements? Okay, so bottom line, there's a hundred points total to be earned in this course, up to a hundred points. And when it comes time to assign the final course grades, to enter those into the college's system at the end of the semester when faculty members do that, I just simply go by this. If the grade falls between 90 and 100, that's an A. 80 to 89 to B. I, I, I emotionally detach myself from that. You know, it's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. Any questions about any of that? On the weekly discussion board post, do we have until Friday to post both of them? Like the no, uh, you'll have until the end of the day, 11.59 on Friday to post your primary, and then you'll have another 24 hours at the end of the day on Saturday to post your second quiz. One of the reasons for that is, I mean, I don't know what motivated your question, but somebody might be saying, I just want to get them over with, right? But in an asynchronous discussion board, not a live discussion board, um, you may have to wait for your classmates, right? And so I think it's better just to wait until the primary post closes to, to do the second quiz. Good question. What else? Okay, so what this make uh, this late work and makeup exam policy essentially says is that there are no makeups on the work in this course. Okay, um, four, four, and four are dropped from quizzes, lecture quizzes, reading quizzes, and discussion board posts. Uh, you have your core competency assessments from the very beginning of the semester. You can work on those. No reason to need to make up on those, right, or to turn those in late, okay? And then the final exam is just when the college has the final exam, <laughs> which is, for you guys, is at the very bottom of this document. Final exam for this class is Tuesday, May the 11th, 10.15 to 12.15. Again, that's determined by the college. And notice it's a different start time than you're accustomed to. I'll remind you of that as we get down towards the end of the semester, you'll be used to, after 16 weeks, or 15 weeks anyway, you'll be used to coming in here at 10.50, and then all of a sudden the college says, oh, wait a minute, you've got to be here at 10.15. Right. Okay. Um, what this... Uh, the, the main message that I'm trying to get across here in the technology outage policy and contingency plans is um, even though this is a face-to-face -face class, there is still some stuff that you're going to have to do on the internet, Blackboard, and um, you should anticipate, you know, technical problems that you might have. Don't wait until 11:59 on the due date for core competency one assessment. Uh, to turn it in. You might run into some problems. Okay. That due date includes, that due date and time includes any considerations for technical problems that you might run into. So don't wait until the very end. Have a contingency plan. I think that's a big deal whether it's a face-to-face -face class that's web enhanced or whether it's a fully online class. You know you're going to have to turn in some things online. You know you're going to have to uh, have a working computer and internet connection. Uh, have a backup plan, right? Yeah, you know, you run into, I, you know, I was sitting at home yesterday, and for a good chunk of the day, my internet's out. 
It does happen, right? But if that happens, when you, you know, you're mad, when you work from mainly, you got to have a backup plan about it. Fortunately for you guys, there's not a whole lot that you have to do online, you know, in terms of meeting deadlines. So the core competency assessments is really good, I think, for you guys. Oh, in the discussion boards. I already mentioned that in our Tuesday, Thursday class sessions, you should power down your cell phone if you bring a cell phone with you. I do allow people to use laptops or tablets to take notes, but you have to use it for the whatever we're dealing with in course, in the class session. You can't let me do another thing that distracts the people around you um, and uh, distracts me. And as I said, most importantly, it distracts you. So please don't do that if you decide. I don't see anybody in here with a device like that today, so maybe you are just a group that doesn't do that. But if you do decide to bring one with you, you know, make sure that you're using it to take notes or, or whatever it is that we're doing in class. Okay. All right. Uh, the attendance policy, I take regular attendance. I don't add points for perfect attendance. I don't subtract points for excessive absences. I think that shows up in your grade automatically. Weekly quizzes, you know, a lecture quiz each week, a reading quiz each week. You're absent too much, that is going to show up. Okay? Uh, read over this classroom behavior policy. I don't anticipate any problems with that, but it's something we put in the syllabus just in case, right? Read absolutely read over the academic integrity policy, right? All right, and let's look at the course schedule and topical outline. Our last order of business before we turn our attention to some discussion material. Okay, you can see each. Sometimes uh, uh, it's been a year since I've been in this classroom, but. That just have to remind me. Sometimes this computer, just like whatever document I'm looking at on the screen with me, it just sort of squirrels ahead on its own. Anybody know why that happens? It doesn't happen when I'm working in my office or my home or something like that in this classroom. Okay, so here you can see the way I've set up this outline. I hope that it's straightforward. But here's something I've learned over the years. Just because it's clear and straightforward to me doesn't necessarily mean it's clear and straightforward to you. <laughs> when I'm setting up these kinds of you know schedules in the course syllabus. So you're gonna have to tell me. You're gonna have to ask if you have questions. But I've tried to set this up in a way so that the things that we're gonna be doing each week of the semester, each week of the semester are pretty clear and straightforward. Right? So for example, here in week one, your reading assignment is chapter one right, in the textbook. And there's also a document that I will have linked up to you, uh, linked up for you. Did I already link it up for you guys? No, I need to link it up for you guys. Uh, a document called uh, a Public Policy Primer Part One. That's part of your reading assignment for this week. Now, when you come to class a week from Thursday, here you see. You have a reading quiz over that material. Does that make sense? And then we're going to have some lecture discussion today on Thursday. And when you come in to class a week from today, you're going to have a quiz over the information that we covered this week. So that pattern is just repeated every week. And notice here in week two, we don't have it in week one, but notice in week two, this this part begins as well. So beginning on Friday. And that will be based on, by the way, the, the uh, discussion board, what I call versus pairs, are the primary participant is assigned, you're assigned to a particular pair of terms. I give you two terms, A versus B, okay, or X versus Y. Article 1, Section A, Clause 18 of the Constitution versus the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. All right? And your task as the primary participant is to tell me what A is. You know, you can do that in a minimum of a sentence, a minimum of one sentence. Right? Tell me what A is, why it's important, 
tell me what B is, why it's important, but then the last piece is to say why they're connected together here. Now I use the term verses from these things, but it's not really intended to mean that they're opposites of each other. That they might be complementary terms or complementary concepts. But that is an important part, I think, of learning the curriculum of this course. Uh, I try to discourage students from taking an approach to this course where you just memorize definitions, right? or you try to just like have this computer data bank of factual information. I'm not really sure how helpful that is anyway in this course. I mean, I think you do have to know some definitions and you have to understand what some concepts mean and that sort of thing. But where we really begin to make some progress on learning and understanding the world around us, and a particular part of the world around us, which is extremely complicated, called politics, okay, is when we begin to see how things are connected, how this thing is connected to that thing. So that's really what I'm trying to get you to do as a primary participant, is hash that out in your post. And then one of your classmates reads your post and thinks, well, that's pretty good. By the way, don't use these as an opportunity just to stroke each other, okay? I don't mind you saying to each other, hey, that's a good post. But that can't be the extent of your reply, of your secondary post. You have to add to it. You have to, you know, flush these concepts out of the book. What we're really going for here is some understanding. We're trying to promote some understanding of these concepts, okay? So that's kind of the idea behind these weekly discussion boards. You sit in class, and we can have discussions in class, too. Right? But sometimes you need a little while to think, right? You need like to be reviewing your notes and thinking about these things, and then you get a versus period and say, like, oh, okay, let's pass this out, what it means. By the way, they're based on your answers on the discussion boards are based on what these concepts, the, how these concepts were discussed in class. One of the things that I absolutely do not want you to do, and I will, I will, uh, hammer you pretty hard when I cut when it gets to scoring comes to scoring these discussion posts if you go Google a term and then I'm not, I'm not I'm not the purpose of this is not to see if you can Google a term right by the way almost as bad I don't want you going to your textbook and giving me a definition or a discussion of a term based on the way that the authors are potential. What I'm trying to find out is if you understand these concepts and how they're interrelated in the context of the way that we talk about them in class. Okay? Good. So all the topics of the versus pairs are going to be discussing. <clears throat> yeah, everything that you see on the discussion board versus pairs come from the class of zero. That's right. Now again, a lot of the things that we talk about in class are also discussed in the textbook. But they may be discussed in a different way. Right? You can bring in to your post information that you're aware of, but it cannot be instead of a discussion of the way that these things were discussed in class. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't post the question until that Friday morning? Yeah, they open up at, they'll open up at midnight on Friday. Thursday night, Friday morning, stroke at midnight. Now, <clears throat> for I think it takes a, a, a couple of weeks of doing these to kind of get into a rhythm on you know how you need to do these discussions. So don't get frustrated with it early on. Just kind of know what to expect, right? So if, for example, if next week we talk about classical liberalism and anarchism, okay, say that's, what is your first name? Joanna. Joanna goes out to the discussion board on Friday, a week from Friday. What's the date? January the 29th, but she finds her name. That she's assigned the pair classical liberalism versus anarchism. She's going to want to write that up in a way that's consistent with the way that we talked about that in, in, in those classrooms. 
Right. And as I said, that may take a few, it may take several, we, you know, several, two or three weeks, something like that, to really get in the flow of how to do those correctly. One of the, one of the problems I ran into last semester when everybody was online was getting through to people on, I don't want you to do what you said. I don't want you, like, getting some other source of information. <clears throat> it's not because I'm egomaniac and I want you to, you know, I'll put you to know the way I say it, but that's how you're going to be quizzed. Right? And sometimes, uh, I had one last semester uh, in the topic on Congress, on the discussion board on Congress, one of the concepts was veto blocks. And I can't tell you how many people who wrote on that over several classes over several sections of classes, who got that term veto points as one of the two terms. Um, and it was very clear to me that they just Google veto points. Not only because the answer sounds very similar, and it was very easy for me to Google veto points and see the source that they got that from, uh, but also because it had nothing to do with the way that we were talking about it class. Term veto points it was used in a very specific context in class, not in any of those documents that were linked on Google. Okay? All right. So is this is this layout pretty straightforward? Yes. So we have two questions. Uh, every week we have to be primary and secondary? Yes. Posts? Yeah, two posts. <clears throat> one primary post, one secondary post. Last semester you would have had to do a tertiary post as well. I'm just getting too nice as I go, go along, as I get older, cutting so out the tertiary post. You assign us what the primary session is? And then you can pick the one that you want to, um, that you want to respond as a secondary. i got to make sure they're all covered or as many are covered as we can get. One of the things that I hope you'll do, even though that you're even though you're not required to do it, I mean there's no there's no grading mechanism to induce you to do this. I hope you will read the discussion threads that are created for all the versus pairs and not just the ones that you posted on. Because sometimes you can learn some things from your classmates from the way that they explain something or the way that they you know present some idea. I hope you'll do that. What else? Okay so here are the topics on the syllabus. You can see that we start the semester with kind of a general topic on politics and government. Since this is a course on American politics, American government makes sense to me to start with just making sure that we're all on the same page what we mean by those terms right, or on those concepts. All right. Uh, and then I'll introduce you, we'll probably get to this on Thursday, something called systems analysis. Okay? Next week, the topic is ideology and political culture. The week after that, the American economic system, and so on. Right? These are just like, uh, and you'll find some of these topics probably more interesting than others. Okay? And I, I hope that you'll be interested throughout the entire semester, but I think it's like probably like any course, There'll be things during the semester that you find more interesting than others. You may not find any of it interesting, but it's never been a requirement of a course to find it interesting. <laughs> and by the way, I, I put that on you, not on me. Uh, you have to find a way to make it interesting for you. Uh, I'm not a. They don't pay me enough to be interesting, <laughs> to be entertaining, or something like that. Right? Um, I don't know, you know, something, I, I just, you know, as I said, I've been doing this a long time, and it's pretty clear to me that there are some topics that generate more interest among students than others. It may be, for example, since I had it highlighted uh, just a second ago, it might be that, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, we're kind of getting through the semester, the first several weeks of the semester, and, oh, well, this class is okay, you know. But then we get to week five and start talking about freedom of religion, and freedom of speech and right concept. And suddenly go, oh man, I'm on fire for this class, right? <laughs> this that is really interesting. I don't it may, maybe not. Others it may wait, you may have to wait until we get way down here at the end of the semester. Right? You're going, oh God, this class, I can't wait till week 16 gets here. And then we get down here to week 14. So we're like, oh man, this is 
start and wait and talk about it and be able to talk about this. Okay. This is what we call a survey course, which means most freshmen and sophomore level classes, this is a sophomore level class, are what we call survey courses, which means that there's a lot of stuff that you cover in the, in the you know, course of that semester. Um, you don't get into much of it in any real depth. It's kind of like you do sampling things, right? It's one of the reasons I said it's an ambitious course. It's got, you know, I sample a lot of stuff in this course. You find something in, you know, oh, that civil rights topic interesting. Who knows? Maybe one of you decides, I want to take an upper division, an upper level political science course when I transfer over to the University of Houston or University of Texas. Or Maybe I want to take an entire 16 week course semester just on civil rights. If you look at the catalog, most universities, University of Texas, University of Houston, Southwest Texas, is, is it called Southwest Texas? What is it called then? Southwest Texas University, is that what it's called? In San Marcos, Texas? It used to be called Southwest Texas State. What's it called now? Texas State, Texas State thank you. Texas State University, right? Sam Houston State University, SMU, what, you know, whatever you look at the catalog, you open it up to the political science department course offerings, you're going to see, of course, an entire 16 week course just on civil liberty, or just on civil rights, or just on Congress, or just on the president, right? That's what I'm trying to say. We're, we're trying to sample all of that in one course. And that, I think that's one of the reasons the course is challenging. And you, you may find yourself thinking, because I, I certainly do, and I've been teaching these courses a long time, every semester I think, man, I wish we had more time to talk about civil liberties. Or man, I wish we had more time to talk about bureaucracy. <laughs> okay, anything else you want to ask about? Okay, so what are you going to do between now and Tuesday? You're going to read the course syllabus top to bottom. Okay, as I said, if you if something's not clear to you, if you have a question, make a note to yourself. Write that, write that question down. And come in here on Thursday and I'll try to clear it up for you. You know. But you have to ask the question in order to get an answer. Right? Okay, so that's number one. Read through the course syllabus top to bottom. Okay. Um, read the instructions for the weekly discussion post. That'll become a little clearer to you. What we've been talking about in here today relative to the session post, I think will become clear to you if you read that document, mm -hmm. right? if it's not already crystal clear. You want to make sure you do this pretty early on. Okay? Make, a, uh, make a goal for yourself to have this done before you come back to this classroom on Thursday. Okay? Uh, okay. So those are the things you need to do. Um, as I said, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow I'll have the two core competency assessment assignments out there for you. Okay, and let's see. I guess that's pretty much it in terms of an introduction to the course. Okay, I see some people who are logged into the live feed. These are students in my online classes. Can you guys hear me? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you see me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so... Um, I, don't, I hope that if you've been with us for this entire class session up to now, you got something useful out of that. Not everything's going to apply to those of you in the online classes that I was just talking about. Most of it applies, okay? So you're going to read through your documents and so on as well, all right? We're going to use the little bit of time that we have remaining. It's only five minutes just to break ground, just to kind of get us started a little bit on the curriculum of the course, and then we'll dive into that full bore on, um, on Thursday, okay? Let's do this.
Jonathan, what do you see on your screen there? Introduction to politics and policy. Good. I, I'm just wanting to make sure everything's working okay. You can see everything okay. Okay. Uh, so, as I said a few minutes ago, this course is a course of American politics and government. It makes sense that we want to begin the semester by making sure that everybody has a good understanding of what we mean by politics and government. And um, I'm going to give you a definition. Actually, I'm not going to give you just one definition. I'm going to give you three definitions of politics. One's not good enough. Okay. So um, the first definition was offered by a political scientist named Harold Laswell way back in the 1940s. He wrote a book by the title, Who Gets What, When, and How. Okay. And it has sort of become the standard definition of politics. It appears in virtually every introductory American government textbook that I've seen over the years, and I've seen a lot of them, because the publishers send me their textbooks and say, please adopt our textbook for your students. It is so superior to our competitors' textbooks. Your students will benefit enormously if you adopt our textbook. But every single one of them has Laswell's definition in it including the textbook that we're using for this course, We the People. It has become the standard, the classic definition. And it has been repeated so often, so widely used, that I think it has become almost cliche. And while students, I think, like Laswell's definition because it's easy to remember, the problem with Laswell's definition is that once we've committed it to memory, we start thinking, okay, well, that's fine, but what does he mean? Who gets what, when, and how? Like a lot of cliches that are repeated over and over again, pretty easy to remember, but sometimes we wonder what they mean. Are you like me? Have you ever known somebody who uses cliches a lot. I used to, years ago I lived, when I was in Central Texas, I lived next door to a man named Gene. My kids called him Mr. Gene. I don't remember his last name, to be honest with you. I wouldn't tell you if I did, but he, he taught almost exclusively in cliches. It was just a string of cliches, one after another. He would say, well, well William's an older gentleman. He'd say, well, William, you got to dance with them to bring you. And I was like, okay, Gene. <laughs> I had no idea. Actually, at that one, I think I do know what that was. Like. But a lot of his cliches, I, I just, I didn't really know what he meant. Right? But that's the problem with cliches, I think. And I think Laswell's definition is kind of like that. 20 years later, about 20 years later, a political scientist named David Easton offered us this definition, which is also pretty widely used, has been pretty widely used, and also short but sweet. Easton's definition of politics is the authoritative allocation of values. And I've inserted parenthetically there, valued things. The authoritative allocation of values, or the authoritative allocation of valued things. And whereas Laswell's definition is sort of cliche, easy to remember, but sort of cliche, and you kind of like, okay, but what does he mean? Laswell's definition is short, easy to remember, but it's kind of jargonistic. And you sort of think to yourself, okay, what does he mean by authoritative? What does he mean by allocation? What does he mean by values? Let me start with that last one, values. One of the reasons that I insert Parenthetically, I don't think Easton would mind, by the way. I don't, I don't think he's still alive, but if he was, I, I don't think he would mind this because I think it's exactly what he means. The word values, particularly in recent years, when people hear the word values, they tend to think about these nebulous, abstract concepts. Honesty and integrity and compassion and, you know, whatever. You know, people think values like, 
like moral values or religious values or ethical values or something like that. And while that's not incorrect here, I really don't think it's getting us at what Eastman wants us to understand. So if I say instead of values, if I say valued things, then now you're thinking more concretely and more materially. Okay? So we're out of time. We didn't get very far with that, but we at least got two little bits of information out there. We'll pick up with that and really hit the ground running on Thursday to cover a lot of material. Okay? All right.